gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, if you have not received a seating assignment, I kindly request that you go to the rear of the room to receive your seating assignment. Again, if you do not have a seating assignment, please go to the rear of the room to receive it. The program will begin shortly. Thank you.
kindly take your seats. The evening is about to begin. Please take your seats. The evening is about to begin. Thank you. Please take your seats. Oh, you guys get quiet quick. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, take your seats, please. Hello, everyone. Good evening. One more time. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Ajwan Radding and I am the co-chair of the Black Law Students Association, and it is a privilege to have you this evening. Um, I will just say to start the program um, that a few words. Um, one, it means so much to see you in this room. Um, so many people did not believe that this could come together, and every single person who's in this room is a testament to who you are and the causes you're committed to, so thank you. But before I introduce our welcome remarks, I actually just wanted to provide a quick comment about this hotel and some latest news that has been um, developing. Um, we found out, the UCLA Black Law Students Association found out about 72 hours ago that the owner of this hotel, the Sultan of Brunei, is, has some hideous and grotesque views towards the LGBTQ community. And I want to be very clear that this organization, by not by any means, condones that, endorses it, and we are antithetical to it completely. <laughs> in fact, the flags you see on your tables this evening is a representation of how we're trying to stand in solidarity with the LGBTQ family. The timing was tight for us to try and change locations. Resources were dug in. Um, it would have been an administrative nightmare. I tried, I had those nightmares. And, and I just wanna say that regardless that I'll be providing a little bit more remarks on this, but it means so much for you to be here in spite of that. And we're gonna be standing and changing the program quite a little bit to make sure that is reflection and inclusive and diverse to represent the LGBT community in full force. We support them. So, without further ado, I wanted to introduce um, one of my most powerful mentors on campus, someone who probably uh, <laughs> sees me too much, <laughs> but uh, I want to introduce Jennifer Manukin, the Dean of UCLA Law, who is an incredible force and ally for the Black Law Students uh, Association, and who was one of the first believers in this project when I approached her about this. So to provide the welcome remarks, I just want to say, Jennifer Munukin, please come up. Wow, look at this. This is amazing. And I do think it's important before I say just a few brief remarks to say two things. First of all, I too want to reiterate Ajwan's support for LGBT issues and, and the LGBTQ community, and to say that had Balsa known about this issue and this hotel, they would have made a different choice. When they found out just a few days ago about what was going on, they tried to make a change, and it just wasn't feasible. And so I really appreciate the flags on the tables and the program tonight and the recognition that what's, what this hotel's owner stands for is so deeply not okay. But that what is going on tonight and the chance to bring all of you here together is about inclusiveness and diversity and civil rights for all. 
And so we can celebrate that here together under these circumstances. So thank you to Ajwa Nambalsa for that. The second thing I want to say is it's true that when Ajwan first brought this idea to many of us, there was some nervousness about just how ambitious it was for a student organization to put together a night like this in a setting like this with a purpose of bringing balsa over all the years together with other supporters of BALSA and BALSA at the law school and to create a scholarship, a BALSA scholarship that has never been done before. But they did it. And, and to the best of my knowledge, so the goal was to raise a scholarship of at least $100,000 to be an endowed scholarship. As well, as well as to cover the costs of all of the uh, of this of this beautiful gathering for all of us tonight, and while it would be fabulous for some of you who are sitting here to decide to to contribute even more to this enterprise, they've already succeeded, and that deserves a huge <laughs> round of applause. To the best of my knowledge, no student group has ever had this ambitious of a fundraising goal and reached it and overcome it while still as students at the law school. So huge congratulations to BALSA's leadership, and you can read about them in your program, and to all of you who joined us tonight, who, who you know, spent the money on a ticket, who encouraged others to to join us tonight, who made other kinds of contributions, and our sponsors and other friends. I, what, what BALSA's pulled off tonight is really something pretty extraordinary. Now, that does make sense because this is a 50th birthday party, and that is a pretty cool thing. And I should know, because I'm 51, so I had a 50th birthday party too, but it didn't look like this. It wasn't nearly so, so uh, fancy. Um, but BALSA deserves that because what BALSA has achieved over the years at UCLA and the ways that BALSA contributes to the law school um, and to lawyering in Los Angeles, at California, and across the nation is really pretty extraordinary and worth celebrating. You know, our very first black graduate, UCLA's first graduating class was in 1952, and there were not any black graduates that year. The first black graduate was in 1953. And it was a man named Billy Mills. Yeah, exactly. And he went on to a distinguished career. As a, he was on the city council and then a superior court judge. And there's a lot to be proud of in that. But it cannot have been easy to be uh, the first black graduate in that kind of way. And it's still not easy be a person of color in a profession where there are not enough people of color. And so I want to say that this is a way to celebrate Billy Mills, Balsa, all that's come since, and all of you. So everybody who has ever been a member of Balsa and a UCLA Law graduate, stand up for just a minute. Stand up. <laughs> Current students, too. If you're current members, <laughs> we want to honor you and celebrate you and cheer you this evening. And I'm so glad that we get to do it together. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this evening. Thank you for helping to make this amazing scholarship possible. It means so much to us, and I'm so proud to be dean of this law school and to have this kind of student organization as part of who we are. Um, yeah, no, it's really amazing. Um, there's so much I could say about the incredible and distinguished uh, graduates we have that started out their time with us uh, in Balsa, but there's going to be opportunities for others to speak. 
Um, so I'll just say that whether, you know, we've got public interest lawyers and partners at law firms and federal judges and executives who got their start with UCLA Law School and Balsa, and we are so proud of that. And so now I want to call up to the stage, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Tyler Middleton, who's going to lead us in the Black National Anthem. Thank you so very much. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let us rejoice Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on to victory. His Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage our angel and MC of the evening, Ajwa. Welcome back. So thank you, Tyler, for that amazing rendition of the Black National Anthem. Thank you, Dean Manukin, for your remarkable remarks. Um, I next want to introduce where this whole evening truly actually began 50 years ago. Tonight we have with us the actual first Balsa chair, the creator of Balsa, Aiku Babu, the executive director of the Pan-African Film Festival. <laughs> Mr. Babu, Yeah. Mr. Babu started this alone, started it in a small class. He was resilient, and 50 years later, he is still promoting racial justice, promoting black lives, and he is a hero for our community. So please come up, join us. Mr. Babu will be providing some introduction remarks and sharing the history of Balsa and how this all began 50 years ago in 1969. Thank you. Good evening. When this young man called and asked me to come, uh, I didn't realize it was 50 years. And I didn't realize that uh, I actually started the organization because so many people, it was a collective effort. And John Floyd, who is, who is a prominent attorney in South Africa today, uh, who was one of the people who said, no, you were the organized Christian and came from Cal State and organized. So 
This, this tells me that we did the right thing. I'm going to kind of just talk for a few minutes about some ideas that we were discussing then and they're relevant now and pass on a couple of messages. Uh, one message I want to pass on is from Dr. W.B. Du Bois. And another message I want to pass on is from Dr. Ralph Bunch. Um, these people, as you know, if you don't know black history, they stand in the center of how we got here. Dr. Bunch, the message that Dr. Bunch, Dr. Du Bois, I'll talk about him first. Uh, how many people heard about the College of Kent? that whole debate. <laughs> but one of the problems with people teaching black history is they don't really talk about the nuances and talk about the, the, the differences and non-differences. There's not that much of a difference between Dr. Du Bois and uh, Booker T. What Dr. Du Bois was really talking about was talking about the Black Law Student Association here. These people here who are part of the Black Law Student Association are part of the College of Kent. Dr. Du Bois said that, you know, um, we have a lot of problems in the black community, but the first step is to develop a group of folks who can be critical thinkers, who can have skills, who can add a, a perspective, uh, an intellectual perspective to the discourse, and they've gotten past the pathology and so forth and so on. Pathology still exists uh, today, as you saw what happened uh, with uh, Nifty Hustle. That's part of that pathology that Dr. Du Bois is talking about. Well, the other side of that was there were kids who had gotten past that and who were people that it was very important to have them develop uh, legal skills, political skills, social skills, and then go back into the community and back into the country in terms of the whole and really bring that critical analysis. So the Black Law Student Association, we were very clear from the very beginning that we needed to develop critical thinkers and people could make cross references and people could understand how the world works and then you come back and integrate that with, with the, what we're doing in the world. Uh, Brother Funk is an example of that, the College of Kent. So it's important, it was, neg it was not a negative. It was not a negative as it became this conversation because Dr. Uh, Booker T also agreed with that and spent a lot of money secretly to support the College of Kent. So that's, that's again, teaching history correctly. Um, <clears throat> another thing that Dr. Du Bois sent a message, and I was sort of shocked when I realized it was a message. I guess a lot of people know that Dr. Du Bois, at the end of his life, joined the Communist Party. How many people know he joined the Communist Party at the end of his life? And then also, he did another thing. He, he moved to Ghana. Dr. Du Bois was buried in Ghana, and uh, so the question becomes, here's a person who's 90, joins the Communist Party, and at the same time moves to Ghana at the same time. That's, and he left that message, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, his, his biographer years ago, and I asked him about Dr. Du Bois being conscious of all these things, and Dr. Du Bois was a person who was conscious of at least 50, 60, 70 years about who he was. He understood he was the top black intellectual in the 20th century. So he understood that all these people in this room here tonight, with those who are curious and want to understand how the world works, would come across his name. So he was very conscious about what he did with his life. And he decided that at the end of his life, he wanted to do two things. <coughs> he wanted to move to Ghana, and he joined the Communist Party. Well, you know, at 93, 92, not much you can do, right? So that was the message. The message was this. How many people read Souls of Black Folk? Okay. The problem is, Dr. Du Bois said, most people know the first edition of Souls of Black Folk and not the third edition. The first edition always says the color line is the, is the problem of the 20th century. But he said in the third edition, the color line and the class line was the major issues of our time. And someone asked him, uh, well, why didn't you mention class in 1903 and not later? He said, well, I didn't know anything about class analysis. And once I got a class analysis, 
then I added this to my understanding how the, wor <coughs> how the world works. Now, he said, okay, I, what can I do? What can I tell people to look at two things? He wanted black folks to look at the class struggle and understand certain capitalism. And he said the best understanding of capitalism is to study socialism. The socialists have the best analysis. Now, they don't know how to build socialism, but they certainly have analyzed capitalism. So he said, it's important that you study and understand the system that you live in so you know how to maneuver and how to function in that kind of system. So he said, when you find out during the time of flood, then you go study Marxism and understand that as a tool. Then he said, okay, I'm moving to Ghana. And that message was that without a land base, without a pan-African base, without a connection with, with the continent, then we are out of the game. So those are the two things that he did and left that message. And that rel is relevant today. Uh, Dr. Bunch, very interesting, right at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Bunch came out here in 69, and he had, uh, had to come out to see about his eye. Also, he named Bunch Hall after Dr. Bunch. And then he sent a message to all of the black students, said, look, I want to talk to you guys and spend some time with you. So we spent the whole afternoon, whole evening, for about 10 hours with Dr. Bunch. And what he was concerned about was that he was upset that John and Bunch had been killed at UCLA. And he was very, very upset about that. And he was upset that nobody understood that this was a repeat of what had taken place in the 1920s with him and the other students and folks who had been killed in the 20s. He said, what I want to tell you is this. The issue that you're fighting about, socialism, capitalism, uh, modification of capitalism, all the issues that you hear, uh, it goes on every day. These are issues that are not going to be resolved in your lifetime. So it doesn't make sense for you to go absolutely crazy, absolutely berserk and kill somebody or fall out with somebody over these issues. You can come together and work on building the Black Law Student Association. You can come together and work on making sure that the, the kinds of classes that you need to have in that school reflect what you need. We had a, a long fight to get African laws in UCLA. Got one of us is in here again, we should fight about getting African laws in, all the international classes, because they're all connected. So he said, come together on things that you can work on, and that you can come to. He said, also, know your own history. An example of that, of that failure not knowing your history is you contrast, and I'll end with this, Duke Ellington and uh, Nipsey, uh, Nip Nipsey Hussle. It's very, how does Duke Ellington connect to Nipsey? This is how, this is how it's connected. Duke was famous for having the ability to, when you got fired from Duke's band, and I understand he kept the band together for 60 years in, this, in the capital system, up and down the highway system, 60 years. And everybody said Duke had the ability that when he fired you, you thought you got a promotion. <laughs> An example of that is, is Charlie Mingus, who fired Charlie Mingus. Um, and, he's, and the reason for that is this. When you deal with the craziness and the pathology in the black community that's expressed in and around the music, the long history of folks who, that, that have been killed in that process, Sam Cooke, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then you have to have an ability to manage and to handle that. And what happened the other night was that that young man didn't have folks around him that said, listen, you have to talk to these people, talk to folks in such a way that you can get them to understand what's happening and how to manage that. Duke Ellington, that would not have happened because if you know the history, you say, well, how did Duke do it? You have to learn how to do that. That's very important. And then the final thing is for the folks who are not law students is that what we need in the black community today is restarting the Black Congress, a Black Federation of Organizations, so we can think, we can know what's going on in the community, know what's going on in the city, and deal with it on a on a uh, collective basis. The final thing is that is the African proverb says, "The final test of special people is ego." The old proverb from Timbuktu: <coughs> "The final test, especially you're always lucky, you're always smart, things go your way." 
and finally something so big, so complex, so beyond your understanding, you have to humble yourself, meditate, and step back and submit and go looking at the information at the knowledge. The final test is, is ego. We have a lot of ego in the black community. Uh, the, the people are fighting four or five people up here running for uh, supervisor roles. All this, all this is the final test. So we need to listen to these ancestors, think about it, and apply these blessings, and we'll go forward. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, next I'm in proud to introduce a video that just kind of encapsulates what the past 50 years has been for us. Please enjoy. So next, I would like to introduce a 3L in our organization, Layla Abdul. She's our political chair and has transformed our organization to become more active, more politically engaged, and to have a voice every single day and every single week on our campus and in Los Angeles and beyond. So I am proud to introduce Layla. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so honored to be able to introduce our Champion of Change honoree tonight. Her name is Lola Smallwood Cuevas. <laughs> Lola Smallwood Cuevas is a project director at the UCLA Labor Center and co-founder of the LA Black Worker Center. Her work at the Labor Center has focused on exploring the role of unions and African-American workers in LA's economy. Incubated at the, LA, at the UCLA Labor Center, <clears throat> the LA Black Worker Center, LABWC, is the first worker center in California focused on solving the black job crisis through action and mobilization and unionization. It is the model for a national black worker center project. The BWC aims to build power among black workers to create greater access to quality jobs, address employment discrimination, and transform industries that employ black workers. The LABWC grew out of Ms. Smallwood Cuevas' work coordinating the UCLA African American Union Leadership School, AAULS. Serving as a national model, the LA Black Workers Center helped to launch the National Black Workers Center Project. There are currently centers operating in Oakland, Chicago, Baltimore, DC, and St. Louis. Ms. Smallwood Cuevas currently serves on the executive committee of the National Black Workers Center Network. Please join us in welcoming Lola Smallwood Cuevas.
Good evening, everyone. I know we're in the Beverly Hills Hotel, but this is BSLA. Okay, so let's use our voices. Good evening, family. Well, thank you. I, I am a union organizer. I'm a community organizer. I'm, this setting is a little um, different for me, so I want us to relax and be together and celebrate this amazing organization. And let's give BSLA a hand, a round of applause for 50 years, for 50 years and honoring our elders who paid the price, right? Who paid the price for us um, to be here and to celebrate in such beauty. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I also want to lift up uh, Critical Race Studies and UCLA Law School. Are you in the house, Critical Race Studies? Thank you so much to our dear, dear, dear sister, Dr. Um, Cheryl Harris um, and Jasleen um, and the family at Critical Race Studies that have helped to educate us as activists in the community about how we can really use the law as a weapon in fighting some of the 21st century challenges and barriers that black workers face. As community organizers, as folks who are working every day, we understand the problem. Um, our members are the experts of what the black jobs crisis is, but it, we need support, we need relationships, we need allies, we need mentors, we need educators like you to help us understand the ways in which we can weaponize this law to fight discrimination, exclusion, and the barriers that our black workers face. And I wanna thank Critical Race Studies for all that they've done, especially helping us to launch the first discrimination-free LA legal clinic in Los Angeles once a month. There is a clinic that is explicitly dedicated to dealing with racial injustice, dealing with race discrimination, and trying to rebuild the maniacal dismantling that has happened of the law in a way that workers know their rights and that we can fight together to protect our community. And so we thank you, uh, Critical Race Studies, for that work. Um, I also want to, I, I mentioned uh, Dr. Harris and, um, and at the Black Worker Center, we do a lot of storytelling. And, and, I, and I wanna say that Dr. Cheryl Harris is, is an amazing organizer who stood up um, with the Black Worker Center. We were invited by the Obama administration to participate in the White House Summit on Worker Voice. And in that opportunity, uh, we uh, had an opportunity to meet and build relationships with some of the heads of the Department of Labor and the Labor Secretary. And in the conversations, our members, and I'm thinking about uh, Brian McNeil, who's one of our members back there, and I wanna recognize our members, Brian and Ted, and our co-directors, LaTanya Harris and Janelle. But in the conversations, our members raised the very important point. At the time, the Black Worker Center was fighting to ensure that the $23 billion being invested in public transit projects actually benefited black people, that black folks could actually get jobs on those projects. Our research has shown that 10% of the workforce, 10% of apprentices, excuse me, at the time in our region were black, but only two and a half percent were showing up on projects across the city. And when we were at the White House, the conversation was, how do we actually strengthen federal affirmative action guidelines to be able to use it in Los Angeles where we are an anti-affirmative action state? And it was Dr. Cheryl Harris that helped us really answer the question, how do we approach that work? And in the end, we were able to submit a letter led by Dr. Harris with over 35 legal scholars, many of you in this room, signing and supporting the fact that the Obama administration could and should update their federal affirmative action guidelines which were based on 1971 census data. And so in 2016, the, Debar the Department of Labor welcomed a delegation of 15 black construction workers. It was the first black delegation of workers to the federal, our federal Department of Labor and workers were able to tell their stories of exclusion and discrimination and we won some major advances in that conversation. Um, that was the summer of 2016. 
And we know what happened in November of 2016, and we won't say any more about that. But we continue to fight. We continue, we continue to fight. So um, I wanted to share a little bit, because I feel like um, our elders started us off with this rich history um, in storytelling. Um, but I want to just lift up the ways in which black workers are organizing around the horrific, and I mean devastating, I mean community destabilizing job crisis in Los Angeles. And we're fighting to build a, an, equitable, an equitable economy where our families can thrive and where our communities can be sustained. And it is intensely hard work. Anti-worker measures and the enduring legacy of US racism have resulted in public policies and social norms and institutional practices that have created a perfect storm for black workers in our community, a perfect storm of disparity. And for us at the Black Worker Center, that really, that perfect storm of economic injustice is really transforming the civil rights framework of the 21st century where we're not just focusing on the issue of access and accommodation. We're really fighting to defend every economic opportunity for black men, women, and families and the democracy as a whole because black workers are the canary in America's mine. What is happening to black workers right now in Los Angeles 10, 20 years from now will be happening to all workers in this country and I want to share what this looks like and to just and to hopefully impart the urgency that we must all adopt in this room, which is how do we ensure that we are building an equitable Los Angeles, California, and a nation that is using economic an economic justice sword that has equity on one side and anti-discrimination enforcement on the other. And why do we need that? In Los Angeles, 50% of working age black adults are unemployed or underemployed in low wage work. That is 50% of our community is not working or working poor. And we know what that means for the social fabric of our community, right? We know that we're 7% of the population, but we're 40% of the folks homeless and on skid row. We know we're 7% of the population, but we're 45% of people in the prisons and in jails. We know we're 7% of the population, but we die 17 years sooner than anyone else from preventable diseases induced by institutional racism and oppression. And so that result happens because why? Not because black workers aren't doing the right thing, we are more educated than we've ever been before, yet we have the widest wage gaps and the most severe occupational segregation across a number of sectors. A recent report that the Black Worker Center published with the UCLA Labor Center noted that whether working full-time or part-time, black workers earn only three quarters of what white, their white counterparts earn, and for black women, the wage is much wider. So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that as a community? Well, we can't deal with it alone. I was talking with someone back in the, in the reception. We have to begin to build the connective tissue between the activists and the grassroots leaders, workers who are unemployed and underemployed, with our legal, and, and, uh, our legal strategists and scholars, and with our entertainment, and with our um, elders who have traveled this world, this road before. And we have to use this network, this power, we have to use this to really dispel the myths and the narratives that say that this enormous and complex problem that black workers are facing is somehow black people's fault. We have to, and we, this is what we're doing at the center we have to learn to co-empower each other, to stand up against that sort of thinking, and that's oftentimes internalized racism. 
and recognize that what we're talking about is not individual failure. What we're talking about is a systemic failure. We're talking about failure of public policies, failure of economic policies. And in that process, what we're doing at the Black Workers Center is we're bringing workers together and we're building them back up. We are actually building skills and confidence. Let's analyze these industries. Let's analyze these barriers. And then let's develop some bottom-up strategies, right? Where we can think about corporate practices, practice change, and public policy change to move us forward. Dr. King said that legislation can't make a man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me. The law does not change the heart, but it does change the habits of man when vigorously enforced. And that is what we need to do, brothers and sisters. We've got to figure out a way of how to vigorously enforce and rebuild our civil rights laws that will create real opportunity for workers in our communities. This week, the Trump administration <laughs> rolled back funding for the EEOC to the 2016 levels. When we were fighting Metro, we were able to go to the California, the LA office of the Civil Rights Office of the Department of Labor and get their support in our campaign. But last week, Trump decided to dissolve the DOL Civil Rights Office and to fold it into the EEOC, which is already underfunded and overburdened. And so we have to come up with what are the strategies that address these uh, vicious attacks on our civil rights and our workers' ability to gain access. And we are doing that, and we're doing it together, and we're doing it with a lot of students um, and UCLA uh, uh, law school uh, professors who are helping us to think about how do we work with the city council to pass LA's first civil and human rights ordinance a civil and human rights ordinance that will allow local residents to go to their city hall to deal with discrimination where it happens. No longer having to go to a website, wait for the state, wait for the federal government, but can use their power to get their local officials to stand up for them against outlaw employers. And I'm proud to say that in 1955, that type of uh, policy, the Fair Employment and Practices Act, was voted down, violently voted down by the city council, but President Herb Wesson, along with Gil, uh, so city councilman Gil Cedillo, are pushing that forward, and next month we are expecting to have LA's first civil and human rights ordinance passed. And our members have been turning out by the hundreds, fighting for and advocating and shaping that policy. And we're not gonna leave it, we're not gonna leave uh, the city in a situation where they don't have the full authority to enforce this law. We're also working with Senator uh, Steve Bradford on SB 218, and I encourage everyone to go to uh, the website and look at SB 218. This is a policy that will give, for the first time ever in the history of our Fair Employment Act here in the state of California, the first time that the state will give the cities the full authority to level fines and penalties to adjudicate, investigate and adjudicate employment discrimination cases and to allow dual filing so that workers can have the option locally and also at the state level. And we know this is what we need to do. And these are the strategies that workers have and are moving forward to, to replace the blood sweat and tears that our elders gave to build this civil rights uh, movement and protections to rebuild those protections for our community. And so I ask, I want to, in closing, because I see Ashwa <laughs> saying, get, let me get the hook. Um, <laughs> I wanted to just say, um, in closing, that we can't do this alone. We cannot do this alone. We need everyone in this room to volunteer to come down to the Black Worker Center and let's train our people on what their rights are and how to access those rights and not to swallow the indignity and abuse that they're facing in the labor market. Let's come down to the Black Worker Center and supervise one of our clinics so that we can create more slots to, have, to help more people. We need you at 54th and Crenshaw. And I know some of y'all might not have been down on 54th and Crenshaw in a while. You might be overdue, but we want you to come down to 54th and Crenshaw and visit us. And of course, to sign any letters and petitions 
that will help us be able to strengthen our civil rights law, not just now, but in the future. And I want to say this in closing that this is practice. Prop 209 is an immoral and legal law that we must overturn as a majority people of color state. We should not be in bed with Nebraska and Mississippi where we don't have affirmative action law. The state of California must stand up and it must stand up now to deal with creating real opportunities for, com uh, for community. And so we have a chance in the movement. When we fight, we win. Have people heard that chant? So let's say that together. When we fight, we when we fight, we when we fight. We okay, thank you so much. So everyone will have about 10 or 15 minutes to enjoy your meal. So enjoy.
Ladies and gentlemen, from the hit show, The Four, you've seen him on Disney, Nickelodeon, and CBS FBI. At the age of 10, he started to spring his career, probably far before that. He was young Simba on The Lion King. He just put out his EP. Hey, you, welcome my darling, Tim Johnson Jr. Yeah, what's up, y'all? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Good, good, good. That was awesome. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'll set up real quick. But I'm Tim Johnson Jr. Um, I'm originally from Philadelphia. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I moved here about seven years ago. Um, um, when I was 10, I did The Lion King in Las Vegas, and my family... And I always prayed that if we were going to move to Los Angeles, we were going to go all the way. So it's in the family. We, we all doing it. Yeah. Yeah, before I start, I just want to say how I'm so thankful just to be here. It's a blessing to be in a place where just change makers, the change makers. And um, yeah, this is going to be awesome. Um, I'm going to sing some original songs tonight. Um, my first song is called We're Going to Make It Through. Um, me and my dad, I, I put out a project earlier this year called Hey You. It's my first project that I actually put out. And um, I produced it all with my dad, I wrote all the songs, but we keep it in the family. Yeah, um, this song is called We're Gonna Make It Through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. Here's a token of advice, never think twice, cause that's how you get all caught up, yeah, said I never risk a thing, but now here I am giving my everything, I saw struck. Mm, now I'm all fed up. Mm, uh. The feelings only make us do crazy things. Dodging bullets, even though we're face to face. Baby, I'll be your left hand. Show me your right away. Yeah, we are gonna make it through. We'll make it through, baby. Yes, too. We are gonna make it through. We'll make it through, baby. Yes, too. Here's a token of a fight. Always oh, say strong. We're in this for love, so that's why we carry on, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Feelings only make us do crazy things, 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 dodging bullets, even though we're face to face. Baby, you'll be your left hand, show me your right away. That we are gonna make it through. We'll make it through, baby, us too.
Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Okay, this is a song um, called Late Night Jamming, and I'm going to need y'all to vibe with me on this one. So later I might ask you to sing. I know y'all eating, but y'all might have to vibe with me real quick. Okay. Potentially, I want to say the words that I believe. That brings me back to yesterday, to the present future, man. Mm -hmm. Now I'm up, 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 can't go to sleep. I got some things to do in the morning, but I'm, I'm late night jamming. Yeah, yeah. I said I'm late night jamming. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nobody up, nobody up on me. I say nobody up, nobody up but me. When I'm late night jamming, it's hard to see reality when you're standing right in front of me. Yeah. And half my days I spent out your way just in case you need a friend. Yeah, I said I'm up, 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 can't go to sleep. I got some things to do in the morning, but I, I'm late night jamming. Yeah, yeah, I said I'm late night jamming. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nobody else, nobody up but me. I said, nobody up, nobody up but me. When I'm late night jamming. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have one more song for y'all. We're going to take it back real quick. And um, yeah, if you know it, sing along. The night has come And the land is dark And the moon is the only light you see No, I won't be afraid Oh, no, I won't be afraid Just as long as you stand, stand by me so darling, darling, stand by me, oh, stand by me, just as long as you stand, stand by me. If the sky that we look upon was tall and fall, and the mountains must crumble, to the sea I won't cry I won't cry no I won't shed a tear just stay as long as you stand stand by me whenever you're in trouble won't you stand by me oh stand by me just stay as long you stand, stand by me, yeah. whenever you're in trouble, won't you stand by me, oh, stand by me, just as long as you stand, 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all. Yeah. Um, my EP is out right now. It's on Spotify and Apple and Tidal and everywhere else. It's called Hey You. And um, my Instagram is at City Boy Junior. And right now, I'm going to introduce my friend, the guy. His name is Josh Levi. He's such a talented dude. Um, his new single is out right now, and he has a new music video out. So give it up for Josh Levi. What's going on? How you guys feeling? I said, how you guys feeling tonight? I'm going to rock and roll a little bit with you guys. Uh, my name is Josh Levi. Um, I'm going to take you into my world a little bit. This song has a lot of energy, so just vibe with me. Uh, as Tim said, it's called Seen It All. And uh, here we go. <laughs> Hey. Would you like, was your dream? Let me try, let me think. Open your mind, do anything. To draw the line before you see, before you see what a vibe, what a bring. Open your eyes, open the mirror. Welcome to my energy. I'm in the driver's seat. Yeah. Where you trying to go? Can you tell me? Expect, expect, expect what you don't Where you wanna go Can you tell me Every memory out of your brain And don't you know I'm a doing different ways And just when you thought But you can't get enough I'll be right there with more I'll give you new things to love Leave it all to me We are supposed to be Got no one to think Got no reason to be thankful Don't worry girl This what you deserve You can never be ungrateful Come on Thing, huh. Where you trying to go? Can you tell me? I said you seen it all. Can't be happy. Forget, forget, forget what you know. Expect, 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 expect what you don't. Hey. Where you wanna go? Can you tell me? Yeah, tell me, baby. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah.
thank you. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed that musical performance. Um, that was amazing. Next, if, if I could have everyone's attention, please. Um, because this next introduction actually matters a lot. Um, we have an incredible special guest, um, someone who has really redefined and reimagined what it means to be um, black excellence on the screen. I have the pleasure of introducing a giant in the industry, Courtney B. Vance. <laughs> Courtney, Courtney B. Vance has been on Law and Order. He has been awarded an Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Limited Series. The People vs. O.J. Simpson. He has earned a SAG, a Golden Globe nomination for his critically acclaimed performance. And his resume just keeps going on. <laughs> it really does. There is no actor who represents, who acts better as a lawyer, in my opinion, than Courtney B. Vance. And he is one of the reasons why I'm in law school. So it is with great pleasure, Courtney B. Vance. Thank you, thank you so much. I, I, I just wanna make sure I'm gonna get those shoes that that gentleman had on over there. I want a pair of those, I want a pair of those. Um, um, thank you for that, that lovely in introduction. I, uh, Martin Luther King's Garment of Destiny. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. The rich man can never be what he ought to be until the poor man is what he ought to be. John Donne caught it years ago and placed it in graphic terms. No man is an island unto himself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And then he goes on toward the end to say, every man's death diminishes me because I am a part of mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Benjamin Elijah Mays, 60 seconds. I have only but a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, can't refuse it. Didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give an account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but all of eternity is wrapped up in it. Shakespeare, first thing you do, kill all the lawyers. Would you and please indulge me in a bit of housekeeping? I, I'm a somewhat of an old school being, trained up as I was by a mother and father who instilled in their children the spirit of excellence as they taught us to always say, thank you, hello somebody, to our co-chairs, Ajuang and Leah Rading, and, <laughs> mm -hmm, yes, Zal and Zalandria Graham, to Kendrick Koch and Saeed Quandry, to Omar Rambert and Jennifer Manukin, to our assembly person Autumn Burke, and to our congresswoman, the one and only Maxine Waters, to our president of the LA City Council, Irv Wesson, to our honorees and honored guests, good evening and God bless you all. I am so thrilled and honored and deeply humbled by the being in the presence of all of this legal acumen and prowess. I have played a lawyer or two in my time, but I, I recognize that I was doing just that. I was playing. I deeply respect the profession and the amount of future billable hours that are in this room tonight. Okay. I promise you I will respect the clock and I show sure don't want to receive an invoice at the end of the evening. My topics for my 60 seconds are the importance of black lawyering, number one, and number two, the, what black excellence means to me. As I pondered these two topics, my mind began journeying back over the last couple of years and the amazing books 
I've read. I said that. Yes, I said that. I said I read books. <laughs> With the advent of Kindle and Audible, I find myself devouring books. I've read 900-page tomes, Ulysses Grant's, Chernow's, uh, Ron Chernow's Ulysses S. Grant, and David Blight's Frederick Douglass. I've read and narrated for Audible Neil deGrasse Tyson's Accessory to War and Walter Isaacson's Kissinger. I've read about our first black millionaires, black fortunes, and about the amazing folks that came out of Pittsburgh, Smoketown. And as, and as I'm in the middle of Richard Rothstein's brilliant The Color of Law, so many of the issues of our times and the themes of other books are coming painfully into focus. Please, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. May I? Excuse me. Where are those phrases today? Blanche Dubois in Tennessee Williams, A Streetcar Named Desire, said, I always depended on the kindness of strangers. <laughs> well, she would be at a loss today. <laughs> what happened to kindness and courtesy and, and just plain being nice? Why is it that in church men take women's arms to help them or assist them up or down stairs, but once outside they were barely hoping to open the door for them? Why is it that husbands don't know that their wives are looking to them to set the tone of love in the household? We love seeing little girls in frilly dresses and little boys in handsome suits going to Sunday school, but how is it that we are losing so many of these children by the time they are 12 and 13? Hello, somebody. What happened to neighbors looking out for our kids? What happened to kids being in the house when the street lights came on? How come we assume the teacher's trying to abuse our children before we believe that our children are trying to put some over on our teachers? What's happening to us? What's happened to our standard of excellence? I'd love to discuss black lawyering. My wife and I have the, one of the finest entertainment lawyers in the business, and Mr. Daryl Miller, who happens to be black. I would love to talk about the value of supporting each other in this business. I would love to discuss putting our money where our collective mouths are and becoming a force in all industries. What happened with Black Panther was not a fluke. We showed what we are capable of when we unite. But with the time I have left and with your permission, I would like to briefly focus our attention on my second topic, Excellence. Excellence has no color. Our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents understood this intrinsically. Our ancestors lived through the dawning of a new age with the end of slavery and the Civil War and the beginning of Reconstruction and on into the abyss of the Compromise of 1877, which our nation is still attempting to climb out of. How did such a great and proud people keep their heads up in the face of the lies, the pain, the ugliness, and the hatred as we waited for our third good? Our Rosa, our Martin, our Murley, our Fannie Lou Hamer, our Joe Lewis, our Sidney Poitier, our Aretha, our Muhammad Ali, our Barbara Jordan, our Nelson Mandela, and ultimately our Barack Obama. How did the black folks of Montgomery, Alabama unite and boycott the bus company and walk upwards of 20 miles each way every day for over a year? How did we create a movement, unite and elect Barack Hussein Obama to two terms as president of these United States? How did Moses, Jacob, Joseph, Esther, and ultimately Jesus endure the face of such horrible circumstances? For the joy that was set before them, they all placed something more excellent in front of them. And they endured. 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 We must continue to develop our spirit of excellence and settle for nothing less. Everything is not okay. When something is wrong, let's not make excuses just because we've seen worse. Evil thrives when good people do. And
In many instances, good can be the enemy of great. Johnny Cochran said it best when he challenged O.J. Simpson with, choose a side. When I think of these selfish times in which we live, I think of Martin who said, cowardice asks, is it safe? Expediency asks, is it politic? Vanity asks, is it popular? But conscience always asks, is it right? And every now and then we must take positions that are neither comfortable, nor safe, nor politic, nor convenient. But we do it because our conscience tells us that it is right. And in these challenging times in which we live, I would ask each of us to search our hearts and continue to practice taking positions that are neither comfortable, safe, politic, or convenient. I would ask us to think of our people during the, that dark period in our country from 1877 to 1965 when there was no safety net for us. I would ask to think of Mamie Till, Emmett Till's mama. Think of all the strange fruit hanging from the trees. Think of the parents of the four girls who died in the church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama. Think of Trayvon. Think of Michael Brown. Think of Eric Garner. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Think of Nipsey Hussle. Think of all the sexually assaulted women quietly suffering under the yoke of bondage for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And then think of our excellent Maya Angelou, who so eloquently penned, and still I rise. You may write down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may tread in the very dirt, but still like dust, I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with certainty of tides. Just like hopes springing high, still I rise. Do you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes? Shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't take it awfully hard, because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as some surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise, bringing the gift that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise, I rise. I would ask us all to get back to basics and continue striving to be excellence. Excellent. Now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. May God continue to richly bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had five minutes. I think I did seven. Okay. And now I have the additional privilege of introducing our next honoree, Benjamin Lloyd Crump Esquire. The renowned civil rights and personal injury attorney, social justice advocate, and for so many families, a much needed beacon of hope. Through a steadfast dedication to justice and service, Mr. Crump has worked on some of the most high-profile cases in the United States, representing the families of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Stephen Clark, among others. 
In addition to representing countless families, Crump has represented them against some of the most colossal institutions in the world. Most recently, Crump sued my alma mater, Harvard, over images of slaves once used to advocate racism and that Harvard now refuses to turn over to the family of those very slaves. Mr. Crump has been nationally recognized the 2014 NNPA Newsmaker of the Year, the National Trial Lawyers Top 100 Lawyers, and Ebony Magazine's Power 100 Most Influential African Americans. In 2016, he was designated as an honorary fellow by the University of Pennsylvania College of Law. He is the founder and principal owner of Ben Crump Law and the current president of the National Civil Rights Trial Lawyers Association. He previously served as the president of the National Bar Association. Mr. Crump is a bad mammy jammy. Mr. Crump is an alum of Florida State University, who, 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 and received his law degree from FSU College of Law. He also is the blessed man who is married to the lovely Dr. Janae Angelique Crump. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is my sincere pleasure to in introduce and present to you Honorary Benjamin Crump. Good evening. Only in Hollywood can I get introduced by one of my idols, Johnny Cochran. <laughs> Thank you so much, Courtney. I agree. Nobody plays a lawyer better than you play a lawyer, my brother. Am I lying? Give him a round of applause. To the UCLA School of Law, to Dean Nuklin, to Attorney Braden and Attorney Graham, your co-chairs, ladies and gentlemen, may it please this court, I come here to make a very concise argument for about 20 minutes only. because I have to get on an airplane at 11.59 to get to Dallas, Texas, where Judge Shannon Moore will hold me in contempt if I'm not present. So I want to acknowledge the National Bar Association, of which I was president, the largest the largest association of lawyers and judges of color in the world, where we represent not only our members' concerns, clients, and constituencies, but also their communities. And I humbly stand on their shoulders this evening as I present to you. I would like to uh, introduce just a few of them uh, who are my personal friends, first starting with Judge Birdsong from Los Angeles Superior Court. Judge Patricia Titus, your UCLA alum, to my brother Akuyu Babo and attorney John Floyd, some of the founding members of the UCLA Black Law Students Association. And so many good friends, attorney Peter Carr, attorney Jennifer Fisher, Attorney Tanya Taylor, Attorney Tiffany Gillott, and will all the black lawyers and judges assembled with us this, this evening please stand and be recognized. All of you, we're all here together. Thank you. Thank you for not thinking it robbery 
to be here with the Black Law Students Association. And certainly to Garcelle Bouvet, Mr. Terry Cruz, and of course, Courtney Vance. I have my manager here, Mr. Cameron Mitchell, and I have a few special guests that I have to take just a moment to say something about. I have uh, one of my former clients who was a mentee of mine who had a baby when she started law school, and there were some of those who told her, you should probably just wait a few years and concentrate on raising your baby. But attorney Brianna Williams did not listen to them, and she ended up graduating from Harvard Law School at the top of her class. So Brianna, salute. And I have this young woman who I've known literally since she was a 17-year-old kid, Terry, before she came out here and started being a phenomenal comedian. We didn't know Ida Rodriguez was going to blow up. And if you don't believe me, she has a, a Netflix stand-up special produced by Tiffany Haddish and Wanda Sykes coming out soon. So y'all give it up for my girl, Ida Rodriguez. I would like to present the argument to you all, ladies and gentlemen of this jury, that if we follow the example of Ben Franklin, then America would be a better society. And yet the world would be a better to society. I will have as my title this evening, the evolution of Ben Franklin and the hope for America. Now Ben Franklin is my favorite of all the founding fathers. And he's not my favorite just because he has a cool first name. <laughs> and Terry, he's not my favorite because his big face is on the front of the $100 bill. <laughs> Even though I understand it's good to have some Benjamins in your bank account. And he's not my favorite founding father, ladies and gentlemen, because he was not a slave owner. Because he was a slave owner, like all the other founding fathers of America. They owned black people as property. You see, they believed blacks were inferior to whites. They were taught that. They talked about it every day in society. In fact, they were indoctrinated with this belief that blacks were inferior to whites. So Ben Franklin was no different from any other man in society at that time. It was a societal norm, an accepted reality to many that blacks were just inferior. But you see, Ben Franklin also was a Renaissance man. And he owned one of the early newspapers in America, the Pennsylvania Gazette. And, and I must admit, he actually advertised for the sale of slaves in his newspaper. And also, to you young legal scholars, he also advertised, Dean, that we had to follow the Fugitive Slave Act, that if you found a black person that was not on a plantation, was not on chains with his master, that you had an obligation by law to take that black person to the nearest police officer back then called the slave enforcers 
and you have an obligation to get him back in his proper place. But Ben Franklin truly was a renaissance man. He was a newspaper owner. He started it at 23. The Pennsylvania Gazette became one of our first national newspapers in America by 25. He was one of the richest men in America. We all know that he was a great inventor. He and Greg invented the lightning rod. He invented the bifocals. He invented the Franklin stove to heat the houses back then. As my six-year-old daughter, Brooklyn, just recently learned, he uh, discovered the phenomenon of electricity from lightning by flying the kite. Uh, you know, Ben Franklin had the Poor Richard's Almanac that kept the proper seasonal changes for 30 years because we have to remember back then in America, we were a agrarian society. We grew the cotton and the tobacco, and it was important to know how the seasons were going to unfold. Ben Franklin was uh, a person who did so many phenomenal things. He was a statesman. He was the first president of Pennsylvania. You remember the 13 colonies were all their own sovereigns back then. So he was the president of the sovereign of Pennsylvania. He also was the first amb ambassador to France. He also uh, was the first postmaster general. He literally created the postal service in America. And so Ben Franklin Courtney was somebody who all the people would want their sons to be his mentee. They wanted, take our son as your apprentice. Because ladies back then, not only was America racist, but it was also sexist. Ben Franklin, at the urging of his brethren at the Church of England, came to make a donation to the Bray School for Negroes in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The school is still in existence to this day. It was one of the only schools that would educate black boys. He kind of persisted, uh, they persisted, and finally he agreed to do it because he was a racist now. Don't make any mistake about it. And it took Samuel Johnson, the great English literary icon to finally urge his friend, when I come to America, you have to come to the Bray School with me. And so he came and he finally agreed to have two young black boys come under his apprenticeship. One was named King, one was named James. And remember, Ben Franklin was a scientist of sorts. Uh, he believed in the scientific process, Cameron. He believed in observation. And so he observed these two little black boys, and he was trying to see if they could be equal to the little white boys that he mentored. He wanted to know if they had the intellectual ability to acquire knowledge like his other mentees had done so. And so after weeks and months of observation, Ben Franklin came to an astounding conclusion that not only could these little black boys have given the right support and the right resources and the right encouragement be just as intellectually gifted as the little white boys that he mentored. He even believed that one of them, if continued to be properly encouraged, would be even intellectually superior to himself. That's how quickly this young man was acquiring knowledge. And Ben Franklin came to the conclusion that once he had vetted this and observed this and put it through the scientific process, that he knew for the first time that the original American lie that blacks were inferior to whites was just that, a lie. 
Yes. And understand, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are lawyers. And once we have notice, then we have a duty to act, correct? Because Courtney, they don't say it on TV a lot, but they tell us at great law schools like UCLA that notice is two-thirds of the law. Because once you have notice, once you know the truth, then you have an obligation to do something about it. And so Ben Franklin said at that point, he had an obligation to do something about it. And that's when Ben Franklin transformed from being just a man of society to a man who endeavored to uplift society. And we all have to learn from Ben Franklin because we can evolve. We all have the capacity to evolve. And at these great institutions of higher education, that is what it's all about, to take this education and do like Nipsey Hussle was doing, go back in your neighborhoods and you try to share that education. Because there's a Chinese proverb, Terry, that says, education does no good if you keep it amongst the educated. You know, I honestly believe after Ben Franklin observed these two young black boys that he for the first time, Brianna, really believed Thomas Jefferson's words in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equally, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that amongst them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I believe that's the first time that Ben Franklin actually believed those words. And Courtney, as I go in courtrooms all across America fighting for Trayvon's and Michael Brown's and Tamir Rice's and Eric Gardner's and Sandra Bland's and Philando Castile's and Corey Jones and Stephon Clark, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I often ask myself, do they really believe Thomas Jefferson's words? that we hold these truths to be self-evident. Judge Burrison, that all men are created equally because that is gonna be your challenge, graduates of the UCLA School of Law, to speak truth to power. Every chance you get is what my grandmother taught me. You speak truth to power. And I do believe when Ben Franklin said, one of his most famous quotes that he was thinking about this notion that we hold these truths to be self-evident. You see, Garcelle, Ben Franklin said, democracy is like two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. Now, Ida, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know who's going to win that vote. But Dean, he said, liberty, liberty is making sure that that lamb is well armed to protest the vote. You see, we got to make sure that our young people who are being marginalized and disenfranchised and made to be the main dish on the plate for those who will seek to oppress them. We got to make sure that these young people are well armed to protest the school to prison pipeline. We have to make sure that these young people are well armed to protest economic inequality. We have to make sure these young people are well armed to protest voter suppression. We have to make sure these young people are well armed to protest racist Jim Crow laws like stand your ground. We have the obligation to make sure our children are well armed 
to not be the main dish served up for lunch to go be slaughtered. This is our obligation assembled here in this room. So, brothers and sisters, I say to you in conclusion, before I receive your verdict, it was my mentor, Justice Thurgood Marshall, my personal hero, who said that the basis of the American Constitution is simply this, that a black baby born to a black mother, the most uneducated black mother, the most inarticulate black mother, the most impoverished black mother, has the same exact rights as a white baby born to a white mother, the most educated white mother, the most articulate white mother, the most affluent to a white mother, the most well-established white mother you could ever find in America. That black baby, Thurgood Marshall said, has the same exact rights just by virtue of the baby drawing its first breath as an American. Now he said, I know that's not the case in America today, but I challenge anybody to say that's not a goal worth fighting for. I challenge anybody to say that's not the great beacon, uh, what makes America the great beacon of hope and justice for all the world to marvel. So it really comes down to this here, brothers and sisters. When we stand up for the Trayvon Martins of the world. And more importantly, when we stand up for the unknown Trayvon Martins of the world, when we stand up for what my grandma called the least of these, what we're really doing is helping America live up to its creed. What we're really doing is helping America be the great beacon of hope and justice for all the world to marvel. But most importantly, what we are doing is helping America be America for all Americans. I thank you and I will receive your verdict. Thank you, Benjamin Crump. Thank you. And before we get to our last speaker for the evening, I just wanted to take a quick second to acknowledge a few people in this room who tonight would not have been possible. Um, first, just to kind of give you a quick story, when we kind of came up together, my friends and I, of like, Let's, in our 50th year, create a scholarship for incoming black law students. Um, people were like, what? <laughs> and I'll never forget that the people who I'm about to mention their name, I'm going to ask them that they come up here for a quick moment to be fully acknowledged, because tonight would not have been possible without you. So Kendra Koch, Omar Rampart, Saeed Quadri, Zoe Brown, Justine Anderson, Kelsey Middleton. If all of you can come to the stage real quick. Come on now. I know you hate me, come on now. Real quick. I just wanna say that because of these people right here you see on stage, as of tonight, we have raised $163,000.
I'm going to get to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> additionally, when I started calling up people for money, <laughs> you would be surprised on how, many, how quick a phone call can end. <laughs> I was like, damn. But I'll never forget, there's a couple, a few couples in here that I really want to take acknowledge. Um, because one person in particular who I called, um, I called up and they're in San Diego and I was like, Jeff, you got to help me. <laughs> and Jeff Silberman here took my call and he asked, what can I do? He asked how much I need. And Karen and Jeff Silberman themselves donated personally $20,000 for this scholarship. They answered the call. Additionally, I contacted Renee and Meyer Luskin, who is a deep, profound philanthropist for UCLA, who comes from remarkable hum, uh, beginnings and has a story that is truly their American dream. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge Meyer and his wife, who just gave another $5,000 to their $10,000. Additionally, to almost my second parents, I would really would want to acknowledge Jim and Judy Hirsch, who have been nothing but guardian angels throughout this entire process from beginning to end. I would like to also acknowledge John Rosen, who, as I put in the program, is the bridge between hope and deliverance. Every single time I've got a crisis, he's my first call. I also especially want to acknowledge a special woman in this room who was the first person I told the idea of the scholarship and didn't laugh. I really, really want to acknowledge, if she can stand up, my mom. Can you come up here? Come up here. Come up here, mom. If you knew how much faith this woman has, a woman from Kenya who <laughs> has a remarkable story herself and is really the sole reason why this has come together. I fell down so many times, we fell down together, and she's here to pick us back up. So thank you, Mom. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so I'm sure I'm missing people, and I sincerely apologize, but I just know that every single person in this room matters so, so much. So again, thank you to the Solidarity Committee, because they are the reason. Please. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. And now to introduce um, someone who's going to close out this show, um, who has, at least for me, helped reconceptualize what it means to be a man, helped, re helped me reconceptualize what power and privilege truly means. He is an actor, he is an activist, he's a former NFL player, American football player. And he is someone who is on the front lines of helping push the, hum the American conscience as to what it means to truly serve and truly use your power for something greater. So with that, I would love to introduce Terry Crews. Wow, no pressure. Closing remarks, okay, that's wow. No, <laughs> oh, man, I am so honored to be here uh, with the future. And I'm, I'm not an attorney, but I am a witness. And I literally, I had, I had these words, but I'm just gonna speak from the heart, man. I don't know any other way to do it. It usually gets me in trouble. <laughs> but I'm okay with that. I kind of like trouble. Um, first of all, I just want to want to tell you. I, I don't want to be really long, but I'm going to tell you a couple stories of my life. Um, like I said, I am a witness, and I remember growing up in Flint, Michigan. Uh, man, and it was uh, it was really really eventful. I grew up in the hood, y'all. I grew up. 
in a place that is considered probably one of the worst cities in America. Uh, my wife is from Gary, Indiana, which is also one of the next, considered one of the next worst cities in America. So we, we always say, man, look at where we are now, babe. We, all, we look at each other like this. And um, I remember when I was about 13, 14 years old, coming up in Flint, Michigan, and it was the beginning of the crack epidemic in Flint. And people were dying. Uh, just everywhere. I mean, I, I watched mass devastation um, and, the, and the demise of the auto industry at the same time. It was literally like living in The Walking Dead. You did not know what was happening. You saw other kids with stacks of money, Uzis, drive-bys, people dying by the hundreds, young people. Uh, I, we had white neighbors and they were gone. Uh, our communities became shells. Homes I used to be at and, and hang out with friends became crack houses. Man, people that I knew turned into zombies. It's really hard to even think and go back in that past and you look and you just go, my God, what, what is this becoming? Is this, is this my future? And I had a teacher. And he was a substitute teacher, and he was a white man who decided he was going to show me something better. He was going to take me out of this. And I remember he said, Terry, uh, I'm an alumni of the University of Michigan, and I'm going to take you to see the University of Michigan. And here I was, I'm like, wow, you know, college was, you know, I was about an eighth grade, and I'm thinking, man, you know, he's going to take me to see Michigan, because you got to understand, Flint, Michigan and Ann Arbor, they don't even, they don't even see each other, never, ever. they don't even intersect, and so I go, oh my God, so it, it was Saturday, he decided he was going to take me to a game, and we went in his car, and, and I remember driving from Flint to Ann Arbor with him, and he was just talking about all the things I was going to see, and I went there, and I saw it. I said, oh my God, oh my God, look at this place. It smelled better. I mean, when I tell you, it was like, oh, uh, the gates of heaven it was Ann Arbor. And I said, oh, listen, when I saw people having fun and smiling and walking through the streets, I was like, oh my God. And then he took me to like this, this big alumni luncheon that happened before the game and it was plates of food. Food, listen, I was hungry all the time. I promise you, I was hungry. I used to look at the Brady Bunch and be like, why did they get that little girl all that milk? Why well, she ain't going to drink all that milk? <laughs> and I remember just looking like, oh, my God, there's food everywhere. These people can eat all they want. And then I remember Tim taking me to the game, and it was 105,000 people in the stands. And it was money everywhere. Luxury cars I'd never seen. I was like, this is unreal. Then he took me and introduced me to all these people and all these, these, these big, big time whoever's uh, dignitaries. I'm, I'm shaking hands. I don't know who I'm meeting, but I'm like, wow, they somebody. And then we're on our way home, and I'm like, oh, my God. This is incredible. I was, I was on cloud nine, y'all. And in the car... I literally, I just couldn't hold it. I mean, it was a short ride. It was about 40 minutes to, to, from Ann Arbor to Flint. And I'm like, man, I'm going to University of Michigan. And he said, what'd you say? I said, I'm going to University of Michigan. I said, Terry, you can't go to University of Michigan. I said, why? He said, well, you might want to consider one of the smaller schools. I said, huh? And I said, but, but all that, he said, no, he said, I know it's great and all, but it's just, it's, it's a little bit more than you can handle. Let me tell you something right now. I'm still angry over that. To this day, I say, how dare you take me to this place 
and show me all the things that you think I can't have. How dare you? And I vowed. I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to show you. I've never been this angry. Now, you got to understand, this guy thought he was doing a great thing. He thought he was doing a really great He was woke for the time. He said, I took this little kid out of the, the ghetto and showed him all this stuff. I feel really good about myself today. But he didn't know. He didn't know he was burning me up from the inside out. And I vowed. I said, I will never, ever, ever let anybody show me something I can't have. Ever. And I, I, that fueled me from, from that day forward. And I'm going to tell you this. And now I'm going to flash forward. Here I am. This is the deal. This is so crazy. I'm 50 years old now. I've done things people have only dreamed of. Been places that people that, that I come from Flint, Michigan, they're like, they look at me like, man, what in the world? You are from another, you are on another planet. And I, I remember after seven years in the NFL, after 20 years in entertainment, movies, television shows, hosting, all the things that I, I, I could not, listen, furniture design, art, all the things that I decided I was going to do and nothing was going to stop me. But this is the deal. Here I am, the, basically fighting my own agency who decided that I wasn't worth actually doing their job for. They decided that I was not important enough to represent. In fact, one of their own was the person that molested me. And when I came forward and I decided enough, I hooked up with this woman, a, a lady by the name of Amanda Wynn, Harvard graduate, Asian American, astronaut, and rape survivor, okay? This woman decided she needed me. She needed me to come talk to the Senate about her sexual assault survivor's Bill of Rights because they did not respect her. I get in there. The night before we're about to go, I am, we're about to have dinner. We're discussing the game plan about what we're going to talk about in front of the Senate. And I've never told this story. I've never, you guys are the only people to ever hear this story. I sat there and I was running out of power on my phone. So I went to the concierge. I was at the Mandarin Oriental in Washington, D.C., one of the finest hotels in Washington, D.C. And I go to the concierge and I say, hey, man, you guys have chargers? He said, what? Sir, uh, do you guys sell chargers? Yeah. I said, white man. I said, sir, uh, can I buy one? He said, well, no. I said, excuse me? He said, well, yeah, but it's, yeah, yeah, I'll sell you one. I said, so how much are they, sir? He says, $35. Okay, put it on my room. He said, cash only. Hey, y'all, this is last year. Listen to me. I am rich. I'm famous. But I'm telling you this right now. This concierge thought he was above me. And I couldn't believe it. I said, you know, sir, forget it. Forget it. I said, that's okay. Thank you. And I, my phone went out of power. Now, that's a really small thing. People say, well, you know, it's just a phone. And then, and then. But that's the difference between a phone call can be the difference between making it and not making it. This is the stuff we are going to have to deal with on a small, smallest level. 
Imagine how it is on a big level when it really counts. So I went to the restaurant and everybody saw it. My publicist saw it. Amanda saw it. They were all standing there. The, the concierge that was next to him saw it and went, oh, my God. So we all went to the restaurant, and I was like, I can't believe it happened. I can't believe this happened. The manager of the hotel comes in, lays a charger on my table, and says, we apologize. We saw the whole thing. I go out. The man's standing there. He's, now he's, he's standing outside. Because we went and ate in the hotel restaurant. I come back out. The guy's standing there waiting. And I'm going, oh, he's still here. And I look at him. He, he goes, ah, I'm so sorry, sir. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry about that. I said, sir, what was that about? I'm sorry. And I realized something. That something was trying to take me out. Something was trying to get me off. Something was trying to take, because there was too many voices that needed to be heard the next day. The millions and millions of people who have been assaulted and raped, molested and abused, that needed my voice to be joined with these women. But something was trying to get me off. And I'm here to tell you all, you are the future. All the attorneys here, all the future attorneys here, there's a bigger bigger story here. There's so many people waiting for you that you can't let these little things sidetrack you. And I knew how important it was. And I'm telling you, a lot of what I was going to read today was about being fearless. And that is what this whole thing is all about. Boldness, confidence, but this thing is, is, is something that you have to be angry. This is my favorite, favorite Bible verse. Be angry, but sin not. Be angry, but sin not. There's a righteous anger. The same anger when that man told me that I didn't belong in Michigan. The same anger that fueled me through several, when, when football coaches were calling me Tyrone and my name was Terry and they said, I like it, I like Tyrone, you're going to be Tyrone. I said, okay, that same anger that kept me going through that, the same anger, because listen, you are going to be in circles where you are going to be dismissed and you are going to have to be angry and sin not. Because one one misstep will take you out. So be fearless, y'all. Be fearless. Be confident. And I thank you. To have people like this, I'm telling you, I'm sitting here with Courtney and Benjamin and, and Garcelle and just everyone here. Let me tell you something. I'm a slacker. I feel like I got to go do something else. I'm like, man, I got to go change my life. <laughs> but this is what inspiration is about. This is where I come and get that blood. This is where... I get the juice flowing, and I'm good for another year. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you for letting me speak my heart to you tonight, because that's all I know how to do. And I love you. And please, please, success is for all of you. Be fearless. Thank you. So as we wrap up our program, again, I just want to thank everyone so much for being here tonight. One thing that you should all know who aren't really inside the UCLA Law family is that this night actually opens up Diversity Weekend for the law school. And what Diversity Weekend is, is when we select all our um, admits from around the country, students of color, we bring them in. And they're here in the audience tonight. So I'm going to ask all the admins who've been accepted to UCLA Law to stand up and be recognized for that huge accomplishment. You guys are the future.
And again, I just want to thank everyone so much. I think that's almost everything for our program. But I just want to conclude on these final words of saying that um, uh, I just want to reiterate that it took a lot to make tonight happen. Um, we sacrificed a lot. We prayed a lot. We had to lean into faith. We leaned on each other. Um, only the closest people around me really know how often I cried and was angry and broke stuff just out of the frustration of wondering if, if this was worth it. But after hearing all the speakers tonight and just seeing all the beautiful faces in here committed to this cause, in light of what this hotel is trying to do, or at least its ownership, that we can congregate together and speak to something much larger than ourselves, which is about how beautiful blackness can be, how powerful the law can be, how powerful we as a community can be. And I just want to thank you all with, from the bottom of my heart because tonight we have created an endowed scholarship and that is because of you. So thank you so much and it has been a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Although we do have a little reprise that we would like. So, Lighting, if you would take this stage down for just a moment, please. We have a special something that we would like to play once he takes pictures of his mama Leah, which happens to be my name. So, take your seats, please. So, I'd like to present to you something that is off the cuff very special and Ajwan this is for you so why don't you take a seat darling in the house like a gentleman yes because you are precious and darling this one is for you Just call my name and I'll be there. Let me know, baby, I'll be there. I'll be there. Just call my name and I'll be there. Just call my name and I'll be there. And I'll be there to protect you. With an unselfish love that respects you. And just call my name. Just call my 
time everybody sing it. Thank you guys so much. It's been an awesome night. This is Tim right here. My name is Josh, and we love you guys. And you. <laughs> and the very last thing, I would just like to thank all the staff tonight that made this happen. We recognize you. You are seen. And we appreciate you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much.